be here in the great state of Texas. We are, uh, I've heard so much about Texas that uh, I'll tell you a short story and then we'll play it up. When I was in college, I went to, I was an all-star. I was an all-star football player in college. And so I went to an all-star football game and we had a benefit and we had a, um, a dinner and they had all the players come across the stage and say who they were from, and where they're from, their name they're from, and what college they're from. And so a guy by the name of Billy Ray Smith, anybody heard of him? He went to Arkansas University, but he was from Plano, Texas. <laughs> and so when he, I'm from New, New Jersey, in New York, so my, my accent was East Coast, and he clued in. So when he came up to the stage, he said, uh, my name is Billy Ray Smith, Arkansas University, Plano, Texas. I'm like, oh. Just like him said, plain old Texas. I don't think he said plain old Texas. <laughs> and uh, then he went to years ago and I said, there's a plain old, plain old Texas. <laughs> there it is. Well, my name is Michael Charlie. I am a few things there at Jefferson and I am the, the main thing I am is the boys dorm dean. So when you come there as a young man to our school, I, you are under my care and I deal with you accordingly. Lovingly, godly, but accordingly. I'm also the campus ministries director. I'm in charge of all the spiritual activity happens on our campus. I'm also our recruitment director and our athletic director when we have teams. We're in search of athletes now, so if anyone out there wants to come to our school and enhance us, with your athletic proudness, I would love to have you. Uh, my wife of Lynn Lee, my wife is Lynn Lee Charles. We've been married now 13 years, going on our 14th year. And uh, we have four lovely children, Malik, Latai, James, and our new one, who now just turned a year old and he's walking, David Elijah. We came here from well, when we first started taking this walk with God, it was, man, I guess it was about maybe four years, four or five years ago now. And you know, up until that time, I was a worldly guy. I really was. And I was not born an Adventist. I wasn't even, I was born a Christian, but just wasn't born an Adventist. <coughs> My wife is a third generation Adventist, so it worked out great. Third generation Adventist. First generation sinner, we just was a <laughs> message just like that. And so uh, I remember reading a Bible text about five years ago. I read a Bible text, and it was in Joshua in chapter 24. And I'm going to paraphrase the text, but Joshua <laughs> had called all the people of Israel up, and he was challenging them, all the leaders of different tribes, and challenging them choose you this day whom you will serve. And he had a little, you know, rebel out there, you know, you're going to do this, you're going to serve the gods that your forefathers served. But, you know, when he got to all that, he said, well, for me and my house, in regards to what you think, me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. So at that point, the Bible spoke to me. I'm like, you can do what I can do. That's a good thing to do. I'm always behind following good leaders. And he's going to direct me to God, and God is his leader. God be a good leader for me. And so prior to that, when I was a young type, when I was in high school, let's talk about those times now. I grew up, I grew up not in one of these cushy little piney woody towns that you all are, that's going to be a part. I'm in the concrete jungle. I'm in the project units. I'm in the middle of the city. I'm in a city where there's 8 million people across the river from a city where there are 20 million people, New York City. And so I grew up in Newark, New Jersey. And then going to Newark, New Jersey, I had uh, the things that most high school young people do. I, I went to church on Sunday. My mother was a Methodist. And so I went to church with her. My father was in a home, but he was a Catholic. He was a Catholic, and um, he was also a uh, Mason by trade, too. And my grandmother was an Easter star. 
uh, just as a sister sorority or fraternity or group to the Masons. And uh, my mother worked for the church, and so we always went to the Methodist church. And I knew growing up that, you know, church probably just wasn't the thing for me. I'd go there, spend my time, listen to the person speak, but I would never really get anything out of the message. Kind of tune out, like a lot of students do. I lay down and go to sleep, like my students do sometimes. And, or, like I do when I was there. And, uh, you know, people always shake me. And then at the end of the sermon, I find myself waking up and joining the crowd in and then walking out. And I put my time in church. I never really got anything out of the spirit. And I find that, you know, young folks even today still do that. Don't get anything spiritually out of church. So uh, my quest, as I've gotten on this path of God, is to try to inspire young folks to get a little bit more out of church. You know, there's a lot of good things in church. You don't have to grow up to be a pastor. You don't have to go to be a speaker. But you should grow up loving the Lord. You really should grow up loving the Lord. And there's so many things out there. You know, there's, there's basketball, there's sports. And all kinds of sports that people get into. And that's the big thing. Because that's the big money maker. People feel that, you know, it's a talent that's easy to produce. A lot easier than singing or acting. You know, you get out there and be a player on somebody's team. And uh, you can make just as much money, have just, even more fame. I remember actors used to come to our locker room and all. Oh, wow, they're meeting all these professional athletes, and they're all over the TV, and they're all in these movies. And we were like, hey, you know, they're just another guy to us. And they're thinking that we, you know, they just want to bow down to us. And so, and going there, uh, after four years of high school, I was a star athlete there in high school also. I just, I guess kind of football was just always my thing. I was always physical, I was always aggressive, I was always a, a hard player and a good student. I listened a lot. And when everybody told me something, I was listening. You know, I never kind of tuned people out. And so that made me a better player. And so after four years of high school, I go on, and I attend, I accept a scholarship to Syracuse University. And my own Syracuse is there. Upstate New York. Upstate New York. So about five hours from my hometown, home city. And uh, Syracuse University, at that time in the uh, early 80s, late 70s there, we had the number one school of communication, probably still is, the Newhouse School of Communications. And I attended there where I received a Bachelor of Arts degree and public speaking. And I was assuming that I was going to use that degree to come out and announce football games, interview players, interview athletes, work for ESPN. But the best the Lord had a different plan for me. Amen. And I like his plan a little bit better. I like his plan a lot better. And as I went to Syracuse, I did the normal thing that people do when they're in college. I went to school, chased girls, I had parties. And Join the fraternity. But the most thing I've done there besides studying is I played a lot of football. I played a lot of football in this place called the Carrier Dome. And so as I played and spent my time growing, because you know when I went to college, when I first went to college, I was 16 years old. So a lot of our, my students now are 16 and they say, well, they were kind of special. I don't, I don't know if it was special. I had a late birthday. I skipped the grade and when I was in my lower elementary grade, and I don't think they do those type of things now, but I guess I was blessed. There was somebody there in school, though, younger than me, there was a 15 year old there, too. And so we went on. But I excelled more, I started maturing more physically and got stronger. By the time my senior year came, I was one of the top players. They put me on the cover of the, uh, the uh, football programs, and I was one of the top players in the country at this time. And now, as an All-American, Census All-American, I'm now being touted by the NFL scouts. And the National Football League would come to our college on a regular basis and test me and put me through these myriads of tests and strength tests and conditioning tests to see how fast I was and how agile I was and what my mental capacity was and you know, all kinds of testing done. And so it came that great day in 1983 when it was time to get picked. 
time to go to the NFL. And I was hoping and praying that I was ready to go. And the Dolphins had been talking to me and said that, hey, we want to put you in our, in our first pick. We want to use you for our first pick. And I'm like, super, I want to be a first pick in my soul. But when it came to that time to get a pick, you know, there's a scrawny little quarterback out of Pennsylvania by the name of Dan Marino. <laughs> He was available still. I don't know how. They picked all these quarterbacks beforehand, and he was the best one of that draft next to John Elwood. And so they picked him instead of me, and then by the next round, I was still available. So he got, they, got, they got two for the price of one, basically. And so they got me and Dan Marino, and so the first two picks to the Miami Dolphins in 1983 was me, Michael Charles, and Dan Marino. And so I played there for four years, and then by playing with the Dolphins there, you know, I had a couple of good years. I, I grew up, I became an adult there. And I remember picking my 21st birthday. Because when they initially drafted me, I was still 20. I wasn't even legal in a lot of places. But it was my 21st birthday. And then shortly after that, we had one of the best years in Dolphin history, one of them. You know, they had the best year of their undefeated season in 72. And here it is now, 10 years later. And we we're 14 and 2, 14 wins, 2 losses, and we're heading on our way to Super Bowl 19. There in Super Bowl 19, we go and we play against the San Francisco 49ers, who are 15 and 1 at that time. And they just had an upstart quarterback by the name of Joe Montana. <laughs> so I had to play against all these great people on my team and my and against me as my foe at this time. And then my years with the Dolphins only lasted about four. Then I got traded to a team in San Diego, San Diego Chargers. So the Dolphins sent me 3,000 miles away from my home to play in San Diego. And life was tough back then to go from Miami to San Diego. It was kind of tough. <laughs> and so, you know, my, my team was very spontaneous and funny team that we had there. And, uh, they, Narcissist guys just tip my shirt off. And there's me making a big play against Dan Marino, Joe Montana one day. And then I mean, my years there last about three years there with them. And then I went over to this guy's team. Anybody familiar with that guy? Al Davis, the great performer. Al Davis, legend coach and, and also the owner of the Raider team. And so in 19. 89, the Raiders decided to move their team to Oakland and became the Los Angeles Raiders. And at that time, when they were in Los Angeles, uh, our, our director of player personnel from San Diego went up to there played, and worked with them. And then director of player personnel, he's the guy to get all the team people there. He brought me up with him. So I played in Los Angeles with the Raiders. Many times I got a chance to play against the Dallas Cowboys and had a guy the team play in the Coliseum. Sam, and then also, um, shortly after that, so after my time with the Raiders, it was 1990, I retired, <coughs> unofficially retired. I went home, thought I wasn't going to play no more, sat around, kind of wondered what I was going to do. And then next thing I get a call from Jeff Fisher, who is now the head coach of the St. Louis Rams. At that time, he was the defense coordinator of the Los Angeles Rams. And he called me and asked me to come back and play with them. And so I agreed to accept his offer. I went down there and, and, and finished some more years for the Los Angeles Rams. But I felt that it was all my time. I was ready. I was done with football. I've been playing football since I can remember. And now I'm becoming a young man, and, or I guess an old man, 30 years old. And I'm becoming an old man. In my, in my thoughts, and I'm like, it's time for me to go. And I'm waning out of it. So when you leave football and you had any kind of decent career, they give you one of those. Top football card and comes with a few other big football cards and some bubble gum and a little back table. Take a couple of dollars for it. Have a nice day. No gold watches, no big parties, no parties. So that was good still. It still was good. So I went on and 10 years after I retired, retired in 1991. And for 10 years I went on. 
kind of figure out what I'm going to do, doing different things, not really doing anything, because I really have to do anything, and a good savings account, and saved up. Shortly soon after I met my wife, Madeline Lee, in, um, in 19, uh, 2002, we met. We got married in 2003, and we've been together ever since. And ever since we've been together, we've accumulated a nice little family there. And this is our last Christmas here. We have my, my baby boy David up there, and Jane, and Lee, and Ty. This is my granddaughter right here, my two older daughters right here, Michaela and Francesca. And this is in Atlanta, Georgia. And my daughter, Michaela, which is right here, is going to be our first doctor in our family. Amen. Amen. She is uh, going up there in May of this year to watch her graduate from Howard School of Medicine, uh, Morehouse School of Medicine, and with a master's in public health. And she wants to go to school in Houston, so hopefully she's going to finish up her doctorate in Houston. So we're excited about that. So I think about all this, and I show you all these pictures to let you know that, you know, life was good initially. And life has always been good for me. I'm not going to say that I had hard times and I struggled. There was always some struggle. There was some mental struggle. Just like most of the football players that come out and stop playing football, they just have, they have a, a time trying to get back into the world, They're trying to be the average Joe. For me, I, I was looking forward to being an average Joe, but I, can never be an average Joe six five. Never matter. I just can't be an average Joe. No matter how I try to sit down and hide behind and, and be soft spoken, I just can't be an average Joe. And so I think about it, I started reading the Bible more, and I really still didn't have a church family at this time. I had this big family. My wife was in church. My wife was taking our children to church, but I wasn't firmly cemented in the church. But I didn't have a problem with her going at all. I, I love the fact that she went. And I think as I read in Bible stories, someone told me once that, you know, the Bible talks to you. You need to interject yourself in place of the characters that you read in the Bible. And so I looked at that and I said, okay, well, let me go. On. I'm reading Luke, and I look in Luke chapter 15. And in Luke chapter 15, we didn't hear the story of the prophet's son. You understand? Wow, this story. You know, and they younger them in Luke chapter 15 and verse 12, the Bible says, And the younger of them said unto his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me. And then the father gave me good. So, you know, it's just kind of like my life. I, I, I've worked all this time. I've done all this weightlifting, all, ran all these miles, tackled all these people. It's time. Got all these accolades. Sports, and now it's time. For me to get what the fall of me, I need an NFL contract. And he gave me one. And he gave me one. And just like the young son, the Bible says that not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had together and took his journey into a far country. I did the same thing. I got drafted in May. I got drafted in April, graduated in May, and in June, took my July, took my journey to Miami. With all I had, some sweatsuits, some turf shoes, a couple of shirts. That's all I had. I went down there and got all the rest and started gathering things as I got down there. And you know what, as I started gathering things, I started getting nicer things. I didn't have nice things going up. I didn't have much money growing up. When I first get there, I signed a contract. They gave me a check for $107,000 and tell me practice is on lunch. <laughs> wow. So here I am, 20 years old, a check for $107,000, and practice is on Monday. And it's Friday. And I'm wow, what I'm going to do this weekend? It's going to be a big weekend. So I find a bank, put it all down, but then, you know, I figure out, I go through nine years of playing and, and, and just buying whatever I want. And whatever I want, going wherever I want to go, doing whatever I want to do, driving whatever I want to drive. 
And you kind of figure, well, that's just not me. Other teammates are feeling like that. Other celebrities are like that. I always want to know, well, why? Why do we get like that? Is, is it really just the money? Is money that much of an evil thing to have? And I started reading this thing called the spirit process. Anybody ever heard of Ellen White? Amen. 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 Sister White writes a lot of books about, you know, and they based them. Uh, what I like about the books of all the people I read about and read other books and hers, hers is so much Bible that a lot of goes back and forth between her and the scriptures. And she really kind of highlights and kind of opens up how the scriptures are trying to tell you about how things happen in your life. And so she writes a book called Spirit of Prophecy in Bible 4. And one thing about why does these celebrities think they're better than the average person that they live with? And it's because Satan has these meanings, just like God has meanings with the sons of God, the sons of man. The Satan has the same meanings with his minions also. With his meanings, as he's going after the souls, us. He's going after us. And he says in his meaning, make them care more for money than for the upright and upbuilding of Christ's kingdom and the spread of the truth which we hate. Now why would we want to do that? Well, for we know that every selfish, covetous person will fall under our power and will finally be separated from God's people. Satan's job, his purpose in life is to separate God's people from God. He knows you're God's people. He knows that the littlest thing will get on God's mind. And he wants to keep you doing it, keep you doing that. He wants all of you to be cast out of heaven, just like he wants. He wants all of us to be down here permanently, just like he wants. He wants us all to be dying daily, just like he wants. And we just fall in this trap like we're all, we all, it's like a big bunch of guppies in the water. And he's throwing bait out there for us. And then we get hooked on and he just drags us around, drags us around. And then some of us, he brings us straight into his boat, puts us in a net, fillets us, fries us up and eats us. And other of us are able to pop and strain get the hook out of our mouth and swim on the sea. When you have all this money, <clears throat> what does he want? It goes specifically after people with influence. Specifically. Go make the possessors of land and money. He didn't say go make the bums. Go make the uneducated. Go make the possessors of land and money drunk with the cares of his life. Present the world before them in its most attractive light, that they may lay up their treasures here and fix their affections upon earth and things. Mercy. Show this earth in its most attractive light. New York City. How many people want to go to New York City? Paris, LA, France, all these. There are the Alps, all these nice places, San Francisco. San Francisco, Super Bowl, NBA championship, all these places. Show them all this. Get their minds off of Jesus, whatever it takes. Get their minds off of being correct with Christ and whatever means necessary. I want these people to fall just like me. The Bible says in, Ch in Luke chapter 15, a continuing our story, and when he had spent all he had, there arose a mighty famine in his land, and he began to be in want. It's going to happen. I've done football all my life. I practiced, I played, they made my schedule, I knew what I was going to do for 17 years of my life. I knew exactly what I was going to do, where I was going to be, how I was going to do it, how I was going to get there, where I was going next. And now that's all gone. Now that's all gone. So now what? Some people can't handle that for them. And they say, well, you can't cut it. Oh, it's a lot more than that sometimes. It's a 
sometimes it's just life returning. Sometimes this this lifestyle of being a celebrity gets to you. It's just overwhelming. It's overwhelming when you come shut in. You distance yourself from people. You don't want to see people. You don't want to be around people when you're not in that spotlight anymore. You don't know what to do. So the thing you do are to struggle. <coughs> Start smoking weed. Doing bombs. Start drinking. Shot in the ears. Doing shots to kill and all these kind of weird names that become up. Smoking. Shooting. Shooting things and substances into your arms, into your body. Popping pills. Anything destructive, you know, anything that you can do that can alter your mind, that can get you away from thinking about Jesus, or thinking about your reality, Satan wants us to do. And no matter, it's not just us who fall. People a lot more in the nuts fall. Child celebrities who grow up fall. Superstar athletes who are pushed into it. Get up to the NFL. How many times have you heard about a star player that finally makes it to the NFL and next thing you know they fizzled out? And they were a star. The NFL won it. But they couldn't handle it. Figured it out. The reason right there. Spirit of prophecy tells us all who are not decided to follow the Christ are who? So there's no gray area. It's not being on the wall. You either follow Christ or you follow Satan. That's it. It's not, oh, well, I'm going to follow Christ today and oh, I'm going to do a little dirty tonight. No. You follow Christ or you follow Satan. Who are you going to follow? And the reason we have to do that, the reason we have to pick and not be ambiguous, the reason we have to make a choice, make a stand, because there again, the Bible says, no man, how many men? No, no man can serve two masters. Either will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man, no money. You can't have Jesus and have him rich. You can't be one to search to be rich. Constant work. Constant work. You need more money. You gotta pay more bills. And then when you get money, you know what you do? Instead of just paying the bills you have and living comfortably, you, you, you're so silly. We're so silly that we pay off that small bill and get a bigger bill. Because we got more money than we can handle. Only, only in humble reliance upon God and obedience to how many? Oh. All of His commandments can we be secure. We can't just keep the Sabbath and lose everything else. We can't just love our mother and father and don't do nothing else. We can't just say, well, I'm good because I don't steal. It's not enough. It's not enough that you show up here. It's not enough to show up here on Sabbath day, say a prayer, give a time, and go home. It's not enough. God needs you to submit to him. Will you submit to him? There's things in the world that I submitted to. I didn't realize I had to submit to God. I thought. That giving my tithes and offering was good enough. Was good enough. I thought just showing up in the Lord's house was good enough. That's not enough. That's not enough. As I'm going through this life, it's about 10 years now. And I'm still trying to figure it out. And it walks in, I walk in, I have a cell phone company. Cell phones are just coming out. Can you imagine it? All this time I'm telling you, up until this time, there's no cell phone. Can you imagine anything? Can you imagine being in the world without a cell phone? But who can? Who can remember being in the world without a cell phone? There you can. And so when cell phones were first coming out, they were big and clunky and these big batteries. So the cool thing was to get a slim battery. 
before they were digital phones, they were analog phones, but they still were kind of like flip phones. You had a flip phone, a cool little flip phone. And so I had a company. I had a cell phone company called Touchdown Communication. <laughs> All about money. All about money. So you walk in my door, you walk in my store, and say, hey, welcome to Touchdown Communication. How can I do and we had all these services that we sold and all these things that we sold. And then, you know, but all this time I was seeing I, 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 I didn't even realize until that I became an that there was a difference between dating and courting. I didn't know. I was like, okay, what's the difference? But that's a whole other story. I learned it. There is a date. But I dated. I, mean, I just dated. I just dated. I took people out. I took people out. And that's it. There was nothing. I didn't expect you to fall in love with me. I didn't expect you to marry me. But a lot of times it happened. Broke a lot of hearts, my brother. But hey, that's what self centered people do. I'm so glad I'm not that way. Amen. So glad I'm not that way. I figured out why I did that. I called my mother one time. I said, Mom, but I used to ask her for a counsel on, on me and my dating. But a lot of times in this day and age, we don't do that. We don't do that. In fact, Ellen White says, young people, in the book I've been on, young people too often feel that the bestowal of their affections is a matter in which self alone should be consulted. A matter that neither God nor their parents should be in any wise control. That's what she's saying our people are. Our people. And, that, and we show, it shows, it shows in our young folks' attitude. You know, we're broken down when our girlfriend doesn't want to cope. We can't eat. We can't sleep. When our boyfriend doesn't want to talk to us, oh, oh, I'm just dying. I need to get I can't do school. I can't do it. I'm so broken down. He won't talk to me. That was my lesson. Crying hysterically. Why are you crying? We forget one thing. Satan is constantly busy <coughs> to hurry inexpensive you, inexperienced you, into the marriage relationship. He wants y'all, you young people, just to find somebody you love, get physically attracted to them, get married, and then want to break up your family.
text messages with people, taking selfies and pictures of people yourselves and sending them to people. We know we don't need that. Wait on Him. Wait on God. Take this time to learn you, to learn Jesus, to get a, get a relationship with your Creator. Take this time to do that. And then, when you have that down, when you have your way, your walk with God down, when you have your prayer life in line with your world life, and you know how to differentiate between the two, and God is going to pop on your front. Just like that. Happened to me? I didn't know. I wasn't looking. I wasn't looking. I was just dancing around the world. But God needed me. He needed me to do what I'm doing now. I didn't know that. I didn't know that then. He just said, well, okay, here. You got someone coming in. I want you to go to this, whole, this hospital. Okay? So I went to the hospital. Just after he was a nurse there, one of my customers. So I went there. Put all that together. I had to go to the He needed a cell phone before. Just called back and said, hey, can you got one of those phones you can bring me? I said, sure. I go to the hospital. After I sell her the phone, I say, hey, now I'm here. Can you walk me to the hospital? I'll give out some cars, some flyers, try to go with some more business. I said, sure. As I walk to the hospital, take him to a suite in the hospital. Pima Heart Hospital. So you thought that, that goes for my story too, the heart hospital. I walk into Pima Heart, and their office is right behind the desk, almost similar to this, stand the most beautiful woman I see. <laughs> All dressed in gorgeous and lovely flowers, Smith, me, the alpha man, me, the boba man, was just smitten. I was humble. And then I was like, wow, wow. And so after, that was 2002, 2003, we do just what the Bible said. Therefore, man shall leave his father and his mother. And cleave unto his wife. That word cleave right there. To unite or to be united closely in interest or affection. To adhere with strong attachment. The Bible said, after, after I build her, after I bring her to you, then you take her. Not before. Not before. And so now I get the wife, and you saw my family. And I have a family and this wife, but I still got this worldly attitude. I still got to make all this money. I still got to be this big businessman. I got to have not only my store, but I got to have more cell phone stores. I got to hire more people. This is my plan. This is my plan to protect, show my wife and my family that I'm a successful man, even though I'm playing football. The spirit of prophecy tells me differently. Spirit of Prophecy says in life, my life today, it is not the seeking to climb the eminence that will make you great in God's sight. But it is the humble life of goodness and fidelity that will make you the object of heavenly angels' special guardians. God doesn't care that I'm the president of the government. God doesn't care that I have millions of dollars, thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars. God don't care. He cares if I'm humble, if I'm kind, if I'm loving, if I'm giving, if I'm trusting, if I'm trustworthy. That's what God, that's a characteristic that God wants me. You know, Jesus, Jesus had all the angel hosts at his command when he was here. He could have just said any time, had angels at his side. Yet he did not claim to be anything great or exalted. He was simple. He's a carpenter, working for wages. A servant for those who need to be there. Jesus came down here just like that, simple. While we in this world, all those quotes say one thing. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now John is not telling us God doesn't love you if you love the world. Saying that. You want a big house, you want a nice car, I still love you. Just saying that when you aspire to get those things, when that's the only thing on your mind is being 
is just making these tons of money and you can't think about nothing else than the love of him. Reason why, because all those things that you want, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, it's not of him, but of the world. Satan put those things up. Satan has put those things up for us to grab hold, for us to worship, for us to cherish. And we do. Shortly after that, we've been married now about, about four years. Four years after we've been married and working on our second baby. <laughs> Bible gives me this script. Psalms 107, 17, and 18. Fools because of their transgressions and because of their iniquities are afflicted. And they draw near to the gates of death. This is where I get converted. This is the point of my story where Jesus steps in and <coughs> takes over. When I'm thinking, okay, Lord, you got me. I'm done. Take a fork in me, let's go. <clears throat> I go and take a checkup on me. I get checked up and do a normal checkup. You know, NFL's giving us all these little checkups all the time. And I get checked up and I find out I have an ascending aortic aneurysm on my aortic arm. That's the main artery that pumps blood in and out of the heart. I have an aneurysm the size six and a half. No means. They said, well, Mike, you know, we don't really get concerned until the seven and a half. <laughs> You're a big man, I'm sure you can handle it because I've walked in on my own court, I've just experienced this with this man. And they say stress less, you know, lose a little weight, you should be okay. Come back in a year. Stress less. I'm a football coach, I ain't stress less. It's a 24 hour job being a football coach and being a teacher. And, and being a dad and a man. Pressure, pressure, pressure. But I've always been under the pressure that pressure plus a pipe, not a man. So I stick my chest out, I soldier up, and I plunge through it. I plunge through it. All to the bed. And I help them. I help them now. It's mainly. <clears throat> I go back in a year. Go back in here to get a checkup. Now my aneurysm has gone. I lost the weight, and my aneurysm has gone up. Seven and a half inches. They won't let me leave the hospital. They won't let me leave the hospital. Mike, you gotta have emergency surgery like now. Like, I'm saying like now. What do you mean like like now? Like like, like right now? Like right now. And I'm trying to negotiate a deal because I'm at this point now. It's four years later now, a year later, now I'm a commercial salesperson for ADT. I design big time security contracts. I design big time tire systems. I, my deals, when I speak and I put deals together, they worth a million dollars. I can't, I can't be stuck here in a hospital. I got things to do. You know the commission I get on a million dollars? I'm just like, well, you walk out that door, you, you might not make it in your car. You might not make it down the street. And if you bleed, if, you're, if that aneurysm first, you bleed out in 13 seconds, you won't be making it more. I'm trying to negotiate, trying to negotiate, and what happens? My wife's dead, she starts crying. All you men who's married, who's married? Who's married? You know. You know, when that wife starts crying, you're done. Stick a fork in you. You can't do nothing, because whatever she said, you okay, can't. Just stop crying. Stop crying. Call up, get my appointments rearranged. Get up there, they take me through the door. I'm in the hospital. As I go, a couple days later, as I go, they do some checking and monitoring. They get four of the best heart surgeons in Arizona. Team. And I don't know if you ever had that kind of surgery and I pray that you never do. But it's hard to think, you know, that anyone 
can survive that type of thing. First they put you to sleep, they put you under. So that alone is threatening to your life. Then they take one of those saws, those little circular saws, and they start off on just below your throat here. And they drive it in. And they cut the plate, the breastplate. And then they push down. And it saws through the thickness of your breastplate. And then they stick some fires in it and it fries the breastplate open and exposes your organs. And then they drain your blood, put it in, in a reservoir. And they hook a pacemaker up to your heart. And they put a, a culinary, heart <coughs> culinary machine to hook that up to your lungs. So now you have it artificially being breathed and you're on life support. So clinically, I'm, I'm dead. I'm dead. Now I'm in God's hand, literally. Because it's up to God whether I come back or not. It's up to God whether I come back. Man has nothing to do with it. Because if man falls, if man just says, hey, no, I'm a doctor. No, this thing's going to happen. We're sorry. That's it. That's all he needs to say. It's God who lets you know whether you want to be back or not. Now, up until this point, I had no relationship with God. Why would he? Why would he bring such a simple person back? Someone who never walked his path and steal and rob people and cheat people. I just didn't follow him. I didn't have a relationship with him. Why would he bring him back? Nine hours, first circuit then. Throw me up, hold me up. Hold my heart, my lungs. So you start inflating. So he told my wife they had to go back in again. Just cut off all those strings. You get them up my chest. Go back in and start working another five hours. All this time I haven't woken up. All these four fingers, four doctors, forty fingers inside my mind, working on Four different minds, eight sets of eyes, seeing the insides, trying to figure out the problems, bring them back. All this has to be on there. At any time, one mistake, I'm done. It calls me up again. I think they had it done. My pressure's not coming up. My lifestyle, my lifestyle, my diet, the things I eat, the things that, the times I eat, the things I eat, the drinking I want, the cigars I smoke, all the things, all the things that accumulated throughout my life. Now they're building up. Now they're showing time. Now I'm only 45. They're showing this time. Raising his head now. So it's so my body still to come back a second time. And they wanted to go a third time now. One more time, they wanted to open me up, see if they could figure it out. And now they had to come out to my wife and say, hey, Mr. Charles, this is what's going down. Mr. Charles has got a really bad case. We're really trying hard. We really think he hasn't come back just right, but we want to try one more thing, but we need you to sign off. We need to sign off because if we try this, there's a high probability you won't come back. But we won't try to let you say it's okay. And my wife, my wife knows that God is leading her down. God is leading her and saying, no, I'm just tell me it's okay. You just go and talk to me. And so she told him, hell okay, well hey, you guys have done all you can. Thank you. But we're just going to pray and ask God for you now. And so her and the pastor and a couple of brothers are in the, in the waiting room over there for me. And they start to pray. And then they say, well, let's open up our prayers. And they start calling people on their cell phones. And then those people start calling more people on their cell phones. And those people call more people on their cell phones. And they say, you know, there's a cellular network with voices praying 
for God to heal me. No matter how many times I tell it, no matter how many times I say it, I still can't realize why I even say me. Because <clears throat> I've done nothing up to this point in my life but be selfish, conceited, self-centered. I was nice. I was cordial. What was that ultimate goal? My ultimate goal was me. All about me. But the Bible says, when you have questions, you should truly go. And the Bible says in Proverbs 15, Folly is joy to him that is destined to wisdom. But a man of understanding walketh up rightly. And that was my answer. All those things made me happy because I didn't know no better. I'm just older. I didn't know no better. So how do I do? What do I need now? No. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all that getting, get understanding. Okay, I need some wisdom. <coughs> so the next thing I know, I'll spend the next 40 days in the hospital. Rehabilitate. Learn how to breathe again. Learn how to work with my chest because my chest is still healing. And when my chest is healing, every time I cough, it would shake and the bones would rub together and almost drop into my bones and break me down into I had to put a pillow to my chest and squeeze hard when I was getting ready to cough. Get wisdom. Get wisdom. So the pastor who's working with my wife who's helping me through this time walked into my room. Walked into my room after those 40 days. And he said, offer me Bible study. I have to ask him, offer me Bible study. I said, certainly. I want to learn more about this God, this Satan, the reason why. How are we going to do this? He sent this word in the and deliver them from the destruction. So for a year, I studied God's Word with this pastor. And I studied the Advent. I studied this last time. I looked at everybody because I'm a salesman. I'm always, I read people. That's what I do. I read people. I understand you before you even speak. I know what you're going to say. And I know how to get you to say the things I need you to say. I ask you the question. So after a year of time, he gave me that ultimate word. He said, hey, Mike, you ready to get baptized? I said, sure. Sure. I'm ready to get baptized. I thought, that's the least I could do, right? God saved me. I studied for him. The least I could do is get baptized. So in April, Easter weekend, 2008, 2008, I was baptized. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He did a baptize. He did believe it and he baptized. 
shall be saved. So I went to be saved. It's kind of cool. Back to the thing was kind of cool. I went up there, put on the road, got to the top of the church, got jumped in the pool. Backwards, left me on a good swim. I'm not going to fear me out of it. We go around or anything. I had to realize that baptism just isn't a dip in the pool. It's not, you're not just taking a bath. There's no sponges, there's no body wash, there's no shower. It's a renewing your life in Christ. It's leaving the old you behind and letting a new you come out. It represents a new beginning, a liberation, a changed life. It doesn't mean that you instantly say, or instantly perfect, that being legal. But it does mean that addictions to sin should be repudiated and left behind. you got to give it up. If I'm drinking before I'm baptized, I can't come to the church and still drink. If I'm doing inappropriate things before I'm baptized, and I can't keep doing those things after I'm baptized and let it go. You can't baptize people in the church and think that the Holy Spirit's going to work in them later. People got to be correct prior to coming to God. You're not going to let us into heaven with faults. But you got to work in the country now. So now I'm baptized, what do I do? 2008. You know what happened in 2008? The country was going on this fall. The banks were really full. Everybody was saving their money. Everybody was pulling money out the banks. And everybody was cutting out the credit cards and going cash on. And everybody was scared. So I just found a new life in Jesus. I'm like, Lord, where do we go? What do I do? First Timothy. One of these are Paul's letters to future pastors. But you, O oh man of God, flee from all of this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Do those things. Why? Well, take hold of the eternal life which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Who here, when he got baptized, got baptized by himself? You were the only one there. Nobody else saw. You made that confession to God in front of many witnesses. Many people saw that. You said that I will follow you for the rest of my life. And he's going to hold us to that. So God, here's my commitment. What do I do? Proverbs 16. Somebody like called him the wise man in the world at that time. The answer is simple. What should I do? Commit thy words unto the Lord, and thy thoughts should be his death. Oh, okay. Commit thy words unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be accepted. So what did I do? I went out, commit my words unto the Lord. I became a medical missionary. I started going to meetings. I started hearing evangelists come out and talk and talk and talk and preach righteousness by faith. I started hearing all these things. I started buying in. Now I'm in. And I'm all in. Not yet. I know you all do this, but I used to play cards. Don't nobody knows nothing about this thing. Hope you can go all in. Just give up all your chips. I am is so good, I'm all in. And then you went on. That's what I'm telling God now. I'm all in. What are we doing? I'm a medical missionary. I started learning about our health in here. I became a science student. And now I'm a certified fitness trainer. And all these health things. I'm able to teach people and show people and share with people. I'm a raw fitness, a raw food chef. I'm a vegan chef. I like doing all these type of things. And I said, hey, Lord, I'm going to work for you. And he took me on a, on a journey. When I got out of those accolades, he took me on a journey. And he sent me first to the Black Hills Health Education Center in Hermosa, South Dakota. And I went there and I worked two years there and helped that community grow. And I learned from some great people there and some people there. I learned some more things. And I left there and I went to our other lifestyle center in Loveland, Colorado, uh, Eden Valley Lifestyle Center. And I went there. 
And I spent the last two years there. But in that, in my, in my time at Eden Valley, they had just acquired the city ministry. And so I went down there and I became the director of that city ministry. And I would spend my day driving 60 miles back and forth, driving 120 miles back and forth to Denver, from Loveland, to work with the homeless and energy disenfranchised, to try to bring hope in the dark world. And I would spread the word down there, and I'd bring a clothes bank down around the city, and I'd bring a mobile food bank, and a mobile clothes bank, and I would give Bible study. And I would go visit people who were shut in, and I'd go to the senior citizen places. <laughs> and go where the homeless could be and to different shelters and rescue missions and did the work of God. And then the Lord got me to Jefferson. Jefferson, Texas. I said, really, Lord? Really? <laughs> and I love Colorado. Colorado's a beautiful state. But I've always liked Texas. It's a great state of Texas. I don't think I'll ever get the slang down, but I I understand everybody. Else. And so in Texas, I'm thinking, wow, do I get down here to Jefferson and it's right in the midst of these pine woods, all these pine trees, and the weather is just a nice, nice weather and a good, good change of weather time. Not too hot, not too cold. And it changes when it's hot, it's hot. When it's cold, it's cold. But it changes. Nothing like cold. It's not going to get minus 20. We're not going to get you know, 20 inches of snow. Not going to be nothing like that. It's not going to be a five-lane highway going through the Jefferson. And it's not going to be nothing like that. So I'm thinking, great. This is great. I'm at a good place. And I get to work with the young people. I really get to help impress the young folks and work with a lot of young people and, and give answers to the young folks for their questions. So of all this, and I got here, I realized that the Psalms talks to me. And in Psalms 119, 75, I know, O oh Lord, that thy judgments are right, and that thy faithfulness has afflicted me. And faithfulness, as I was afflicted, what would happen? It's good for me that I've been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes, because I wasn't laid down, wasn't shut down for 40 days, trying to regain my life back. Understood. And we're not. Pastor could have walked with me. I'm sure the pastor could have talked to me prior to that. But he didn't talk to me at that time. I might have heard of that. Before I was a thief, I went astray. But now, now I'm a man. I kept that word. Amen. You know, Jesus had probably talked to me when I was on the football field, he probably guided me for a long time. I just wasn't listening. You know, my ear. There was too many things I loved. You know, I think about that passage in 2 Peter. 2 Peter, and Jesus talking to Peter and says, Peter, do you love me?
Surrender. 